Tom here from Lauren Systems, and we're going to talk about Bitwarden Part 2. And I wanted to follow up and address any questions that some people had on the first video and talk about some of the technical details. If you want to learn more about me or my company, head over to lawrencesystems.com. If you like to hire us for a project, there's a hire us button at the top. If you'd like to support the channel in other ways, there are affiliate links below uh, that get you discounts and deals on products and services that we talk about here. Bitwarden. So I did a nice video, went in depth about a lot of the features it has and things like that. But of course, there's always unanswered questions. And I know I did kind of gloss over, but it is within there to show you that yes, it does have form fill and credit card fill. And I'll show you that one real quick here. So if I wanted to, we have actually we'll open up my vault here. We'll look at the vault itself. I have an identity set up. It's my office ID. Um, it's got Mr. Tom Lawrence, Lawrence Systems, and all of our relevant company information. Move myself out of the way here so we can see that better. So we have everything here, and we'll go, actually, if you want to see it in the vault itself, make me, this makes it easier. But here's the identity. Here's a demo Visa card, so you can witness this card. And this is all, you can look these up. These are fake numbers that you can do for validation testing. Um, then we have the office ID here. And then we have a website over here that... This is actually somewhere we belong to, the Southern Wayne County Regional Chamber. And uh, if I wanted to fill this in, I can go up here. I can fill in the office ID and it fills it in. Down at the bottom, they have the credit card information. If we click on the credit card, you notice it filled that in down here. This is a problem that was in many password managers. Sometimes they don't like these pull downs. So fill in the month and year when they're a type in, they'll fill in a security code, but they have trouble when these are pull downs. They don't always select the right dates on there, but you get the idea that it does have form fill that does work. The other security question that has come up a few times with people, and this is um, relevant, is how do you have it set to log out? Well, you set your logout options. The default is on browser restart. So on browser restart, it logs you out. But similar to, and I'll compare it to LastPass again, because that's what I was using, it's what I'm most familiar with. You can set the login time. So every minute, five minute, 15 minute, 30 minute, one hour, four hours. So once you log in, after so many hours, it logs out. Now most websites keep me logged in anyways. Uh, so I focus more when it comes to security. I'm less worried about it being on browser restart, but as soon as I get up from my computer, I lock my workstation because like I said, many websites, once you log in, unless you implicitly tell them to log you out or clear to clear it each time, they will generally keep you logged in and they don't prompt you each time with the exception of some sites like banking and things like that. Now, someone asked if it had a feature as well, and this is not a feature of whether or not you can select so certain prompts, for example, this one here, this is not real. I just set this up. So I put Tom and I think I put, yeah, Thomas, not my real login for this website at all. Um, there's not an option to set this implicitly that every time I open this, reprompt me for the password. Uh, that is not a feature in here. So just throwing it out there. So those are some of the security things. And the last one I'll talk about is the settings and how it does the unlock with pin. So you can actually say, go ahead and lock it every minute and then set a pin so you don't have to type in your master password until then. So if we go to setting the pin, setting your pin for unlocking Bitwarden, your pin setting will be reset if you ever fully log out the application, lock master password on browser restart, and then you can put a pin in so you can just have some shorter pin that you may want to do that. It depends on how you want to do things it's an option. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, other people had asked about the Android application, and I don't use it. This included with LastPass, the same thing. I don't want my password manager on the same device where I have my TOTP, my rolling authentication to be. I just feel those things shouldn't be on the same device. So no, I don't use this at all on there. So I can't really help with any problems people said they had with running it on their phone. It's just not something I use. Next part of the security. What nefarious connections does this thing make? Well, let's talk about that. So here is the Bitwarden application up and running. It's logged into the same account here. And you know, same things in here. And then let's pull up what it's connected to. Just this one server, and we're gonna sync the account. So what we got here is netstat-np-inet grep bitward. So I'm tracing the process running locally on my computer and what connection this particular process is establishing. So it has a 443, it's using a secure connection to 104.26.111.153, that's the Bitwarden server, because this is not, this is me demoing completely the, the using their servers, not my own, for this part of the demo. And if I go over here and I say, let's sync the vault. Well, syncing the vault, 
establish another connection to something in the same IP space. So it keeps one persistent connection and did another one I synced, probably part of the way their server is set up for redundancy. So it doesn't make a lot of connections. Um, I was kind of curious about that. But the reason I bring this up is one thing I did notice is when it syncs in my main account, which I'm not going to show you, there's too many logins in there and I have about, I don't know, 700 or so logins, it will go out and pull all the icon information. So when it first updated this uh, item right here to get this little, the site icons, it does reach out to those servers and fill in the icons. That is an option that can be turned off as well. You can go into the settings and you can tell it to never uh, disable website icons and it won't pull any of the site icons and away you go. A couple other minor things that are in here too. Uh, I like this feature because if you're just copying and pasting passwords into other things, you can say, hey, just kick off a clear. That way it's not accidentally pasted in again and you can clear the clipboard after 10 seconds. That's a nice security feature you may want to turn on uh, if you do a lot of copying and pasting into the clipboard for certain things. All right, so let's close the app and now let's talk about the security of this system here. So I want to show you that we can ping 192.168.2.2, which is the same network. This has an IP address of 2.4. So yes, we can ping out there. We're moving laterally in the network. Ping 192.168, well, even 3.9. I have blocked it from reaching out even to me. I, my computer is 192.168.3.9. And the reason I'm showing this is because someone asked, well, does a self-hosted instance reach out anywhere? The answer is no. It does the same thing. It does not reach out uh, to any servers. The only servers it does reach out to is the icons. And right now, if I'm logged in in Chrome here, and if I log, if I actually go in detail and pull up things inside of Chrome and pull up those icons, um, they'll all die because I currently have access blocked. I did this on purpose just to confirm, one, if you block access, it works. Two, um, if you are wondering what other connections this makes, it's only making connections that I've been able to find at all. And I've even played with Wireshark and dove deep into this. I don't find anything nefarious it's doing. Um, but this is obviously people's concern about this. Now, it is open source and the source code can be audited. And, you know, this has all been vetted, but still people ask the question and, hey, why not check and validate to see if it's making some weird uh, connection? And it doesn't die or anything when you block Internet access. Like I said, I did this just so I could demo it, but I do leave Internet access because I do like the site icons on there. I don't see them as a security risk. Uh, that part of the code has been vetted. But obviously there is some concern because if you were to find some way to buffer overrun a site icon in there, it's an edge case. But, yeah, it is potential potential that someone could find a way to, you know, pack a payload into a site account. It's obscure. It's been vetted. It's been looked at in the code. But, you know, uh, if you uh, want to get fully secure, you can completely block access to your self-hosted instance and it'll continue to working. The downside is when you need updates, you're going to have to unblock the access when you want to pull a new Docker image or pull an update for it. So keep that in mind. But for the purposes of demo, like I said, it's got a connection to me. And because I... It can't talk to me, but I established a connection to Bitwarden. It works perfectly fine. Now, on the open source topic and on the wait topic, so I'm going to show you what it looks like running first, and then we're going to dive into a couple things about this. One of them is, yes, that says SQL Server, like Microsoft SQL Server. I didn't cover this, but yes, it does have a dependency on that. And what I'm going to do right now in another window, so you don't get to see my vault, sorry. I'm going to find something in my vault and manipulate it. Uh, let's see, let's go ahead and I don't know what this is and let's make it go away. So we're gonna go and delete something out of the vault. And I'm doing this so I can enact a database. All right, so it does have on this particular server, which is nothing impressive as far as processing power, but yeah, you can see it's using currently 2.5 gigs of RAM, 2.5 gigs of RAM, and uh, with eight cores, you can see not a huge, but a little bit of workload. This server just isn't that intense, and actually, let's pull it up specifically inside the virtual machine that it runs in, and you can see that little bit of changes we did, and some of the disk throughput, and it actually has a little bit of processor usage. Like I said, it's not that intense. And if we look over at the host that it's running on, this is an older uh, R710. Yes, I do run my company selling R710. It ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, and you can see we're barely using any real processing power on this. So uh, 
it is a little bit heavier. And I'm bringing all this up because there is another project that doesn't depend on Microsoft SQL. And this got brought up in the level one forums over here and I got tagged in it. And yes, I do participate in these forums from time to time. And the official Bitwarden does have a dependency on Microsoft SQL Server 2017. Now, SQL Server 2017 does come with a free license. The version they're using is free, so there's not any extra licenses going out there. But yes, that is not that particular component that it has a dependency on is not open source. And for those of you that may be confused now, they're going, I thought it was an open source product. Yes, but it has a dependency on a closed source. So all the source code that runs Bitwarden is open source, but it, they did write a dependency on MS SQL and MS SQL gets pulled into Docker image. It's the free version and it does not have source code with it. So this happens a lot. This happens sometimes when you load drivers for things where you can run an open source operating system, but then yes, the driver was not, for some particular device, was not open source. Um, because of that, there is another project and this is, Microsoft SQL Server is heavy handed. It does use more resources. So for those of you that want it lighter weight, there is Bitwarden RS. Uh, this isn't our project. Now, why am I not running this? Well, a couple of issues here. I really like Bitwarden and I like the fact that they have a business model behind it, which means I should, you know, with their paid support and I bought the premium membership and uh, the enterprise feature so I can have the sharing between my staff, I get extra support and I trust them to be up to date. When you look at this particular project here, well, this is great and it's popular, but it's not maintained specifically by the Bitwarden company, 8-Bit. So because it's not uh, I think it's 8-Bit Solutions, the name of the company. Because it's not specifically maintained by them, well, this is some of the things that happen. So basically, they've provided all this, but they do have some missing features. So they also have changed what database it uses, et cetera. So they're doing different things inside of here, and it's cool. But when it comes to some of these features, this is the official list of what's missing from it. Uh, send an email to checked correct mail for config. Um, easy migration from... SQL Lite, uh, they are missing some third-party connectors. So there's a couple little things that they uh, don't have the management support. They don't have log rotation support. So as I'm using this bigger, so to speak, and with an enterprise uh, purchase, it's going to not have all the features that if I wanted to run this. Now it's cool that they have this. I'm not downplaying at all that this isn't great, but you know, for me, I don't mind the fact that it has SQL in it. That's life. It has all the features I want. Uh, it's open source to so the code itself that's in there is being vetted. And by the way, because they're using a the free version of SQL, also you notice it's not, that's why the importance of me talking about the fact that it's not calling out uh, and doing anything with it. So you're not worried about the Microsoft SQL going out and doing something nefarious either. Yes, it's closed source, but it's not accessing the internet because it doesn't need to. It's not a, um, it's not the full paid enterprise version of Microsoft SQL. So at least I wanted to mention that. Um, it also is missing one of the things here that I thought was interesting that they don't have here is the audit log. Uh, that's another feature you get with the, if you buy the enterprise version of it, so you can have a full audit of what's being done in there. But nonetheless, uh, I really like the product. I wanted to cover these couple little things in there from the self-hosted. If you're doing this and you want it to run lighter weight, you want to run this on a very small virtual machine that is lighter weight than the whole thing, the Bitwarden S is probably not a bad choice. If you're running it as an individual, it's probably not a bad choice. It is done in... Uh, Rust, if you're not familiar with Rust, it's a uh, solid programming language to build things in. And it, of course, you know, it's not as resource heavy. So this is one of the reasons that they do this. I think it's great that they're maintaining this. It also means that you have an active group of people, the people maintaining this project, that are constantly looking at the source code. And if for some reason you decided or Bitwarden themselves have decided uh, to do something with the code, uh, they want to stop updating it, whatever, we've got all the source code. It's been forked. It's over here. It's being maintained. Uh, by this particular person right here, uh, Danielle Garcia, and any, any other people that are involved in this project. So hopefully this clears up some of those questions that people had. Uh, I'm still, you, you know, it's not really a follow-up as much as just trying to cover up all those details. If you have questions, feel free to head over to the forums. Um, I have a discussion. There's already a thread already going on this. And here it is in our forums. I'll link to this. Uh, I'll post this video at the bottom of this right here. So... Yeah, this is all the um, stuff about the whole Bitwarden. So like other people have been happy with it, I'm always welcome to discussion and other things. Maybe I'm wrong about stuff. Those are my thoughts on this. If you have other thoughts, feel free to share them. Uh, feel free to discuss here. Uh, if you want to have any other questions or 
debate about this or if I should do another video on a specific topic. But I don't know if I'm going to do because someone did message me directly, um, which please post in the forums, not direct. If I would do a video on how to set up self-hosted, their work instructions are super thorough. So I didn't really see any need to do that. Maybe I'll do a future video on it if there's some more questions. But their their work instructions are top notch on how to self-host. So like I said before about this company, um, they really went out of their way to let you self-host this. They didn't just throw the source code up on GitHub and go figure it out. They made an entire installer for the self-hosted version. So um, their documentation works, it's easy to set up and everything else. All right, and thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.